that we can say that uh, we actually don't know anything about what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> the fabric of nature has reached almost a dead end. So dark matter is 26% uh, of the universe. It's called dark matter because it's not visible. And the reason it's not visible is it's not atomic. And we are made of atoms and we can only interact through the medium of light with other things that are made of atoms. So not only is dark matter invisible, it's may be unknowable. Right now there's a theory that uh, it's made of something called WIMPS, W-I-M-P-S. <laughs> and WIMPS is an acronym for Weakly Interacting Massive Particles, um, which aren't atomic, but they are particles, hypothetical particles. People are looking for them in the underground labs. Okay. Nobody's found them, but uh, they're supposed to exist. And this is 26% of the universe. 26% of the universe. But if it's not made of atoms, if it's not material, why do we call it matter? And the reason we call it matter is it supposedly behaves like regular matter, in the fact that it's responsible for most of the gravity in a galaxy. So it's the scaffolding of a galaxy. It bends space-time in the same way as regular matter. What is it? We don't know. If two galaxies collide, the dark matter just supposedly passes through because it's not material. Is it knowable? Physicists think one day we'll know. But if it's not atomic, it might be unknowable. We can only know atoms. 70% right? of the universe is another entity called dark energy. And it's not the usual kind of energy that we speak of when we say E is equal to mc squared. This is an anti-gravity force that is expanding the space between galaxies. So what is expanding is the space between galaxies. We live in the Milky Way galaxy. There's a galaxy next door called Andromeda and then another galaxy, Virgo. Today scientists believe, and again don't believe me, go check it out, that there might be two trillion galaxies. Two trillion galaxies. 700 sextillion stars. I don't even know how to write that, <laughs> other than it's 700 and lots of zeros. <laughs> and uncountable trillions of planets. And in fact, according to astrobiologists, there might be 60 billion habitable planets in our own Milky Way galaxy. 60 billion. How do they say this? Well, they look at what is called the Goldilocks zone. If a planet is too close to its sun, too hot. It's too far away, too cold. It has to be within the Goldilocks zone to have a biosphere similar to ours, and therefore life. So dark energy is 70%. The visible universe in the form of stars and planets is 0.01%. Because the 4% that's atomic, most of it is invisible interstellar dust, presumably hydrogen and helium. So here we go. The visible universe is 0.01% of the universe, and that includes all this amazing amount of matter. So, other people have proposed that the universe is conscious, that uh, random events may not be enough to explain the exquisite fine-tuning of the laws of nature, the rise of life on Earth, and so many other things. A few years ago, I was at a debate with uh, 
the most eminent uh, militant uh, atheist, Richard Dawkins. And I quoted um, Freeman Dyson, who's by the way now also in his 90s. I should have said Henry Sapp and Freeman Dyson are two living physicists of that era, the quantum era and the uh, era of Einstein. Uh, Freeman Dyson is at Princeton. So I was quoting him, and Dawkins got very upset with me. He said, um, Dyson could, could not have said that. You're misquoting him, and he should sue you. <laughs> this is all of, you can find it on the internet. He was very upset. Uh, I thought he was going to have a stroke, and on the oh, no. uh, a few months later. Unfortunately, he's recovered. So, <laughs> so, so um, I wrote to Freeman Dyson. I said, uh, I was quoting you, and um, Dr. Dawkins says, you should sue me. And he said, you know, I have no intention of suing anyone, but there are three mysteries that have, I've saved his email for posterity. He says, there are three mysteries that um, have um, occupied me all my life. One is the unpredictable movement of atoms. Mind you, the choice of words, the unpredictable movement of atoms. You didn't say random. Random means inherently random. But unpredictable means unpredictable to human observation. It's a very good choice of words. Number one, unpredictable uh, movement of atoms. Number two, uh, a universe fine-tuned for mind and life. And number three, our own consciousness. He said, I, I have no answers to these mysteries, but I feel they are related. And that was the end of the email. A very profound, very humble, and seemingly uh, something we could all agree on. And as I said, um, I have um, saved this email, but this is where we are. The atomic universe is 4%, and um, the nature of atoms still remains mysterious. And subatomic, uh, subatomic particles are also probability waves in mathematical space. So I'll go ask uh, a good physicist, you know, where do these probability waves exist? You know, because if I talk about waves of the ocean, they may they may no water. So what are these waves made of? If I talk about sound waves, they're made of the vibrating atmosphere. But you ask a physicist, what are the waves that cause the appearance of matter made of? They'll say they're made of probabilities. So you ask them, where do these probabilities exist? And they'll give you a very good answer, Hilbert space. You ask them, what is Hilbert space? And Hilbert turns out to be the name of a mathematician. And so what is Hilbert space? Well, it's a mathematical construct that houses the wave function. It has zero dimensions or infinite dimensions. You can choose it. <laughs> but where is it? And the best answer you get, and it's a joke amongst physicists, uh, shut up and calculate. <laughs> if you want tenure, then you don't ask these questions. <laughs> if you want a grant, you don't ask these questions. <laughs> it's not what science deals with. Okay, science deals with experiments, predictions, observations, and theories. But then, where do these exist? Where do theories exist if not in human consciousness? Where do, where are experiments designed if not in human consciousness? Where are observations made if not in human consciousness? So, I think where we are right now in science is uh, we are at a dead end. 
without current science, we are at a dead end. The standard model of physics assumes something called the cosmological constant, which is, by the way, the mathematical construct for dark energy. The mathematical cons the cosmological constant is off by 10 to the power of 120 20 times it's off. The, matem the, the calculated constant and the so-called observed constant do not agree by a measure of 10 to the power of 120. Does it make sense? Most of the universe is unknowable. Dark matter, dark energy. So, what's going on? I'm going to propose something radical to you. There's no universe. <laughs> it's a dream. And it's the way we experience it is a human dream. Not a crocodile dream. Not the dream of an insect with a hundred eyes. You look at other species, they are all having experiences. Look at a species called the Painted Lady, which is a species of butterfly. Uh, this uh, little sentient being has 30,000 lenses in her eyes that shift like a kaleidoscope, giving it a shimmering, changing experience of form and color and phenomena. The Painted Lady tastes the world through its feet. It smells the world through its antenna. It hears the world through its wings. What is experienced to that species? What is experienced to a bat that only knows the experience of its reality through the echo of ultrasound? To a snake that moves through or navigates the world through infrared, or to an insect with multiple eyes, or we could go on and on to those horseshoe crabs that live in the depths of the ocean. Is there a particular picture of the world? What is the real look of the world? And the answer seems to be there's no such thing. It depends on who's looking. It depends on um, the perceptual activity in that conscious being. And in our case, it also depends on the interpretation of the perceptual activity. Human perceptual activity is within a narrow band, visually, between 300 to 700 nanometers, or billions of a meter. As far as we're concerned, that's our visual experience. Of course, we can extend it now through instruments. Through, we can extend the range of our knowing of the bandwidth of reality. But our experience of reality, our visual experience of reality is a narrow bandwidth, very species specific. And that's true not only of our vision, but it's true of all our sensory perception. We, you don't hear infrasonic or ultrasound, but other species do. Elephants, dolphins, whales. What is their experience? Is there a particular look of the world? What is the real picture of the world? And the answer is, there's no such thing. You know, Wittgenstein, the great German philosopher, he said, our life is a dream, we are asleep. But once in a while, we wake up enough to know that we are dreaming. So, who or what do we wake up to? There's a big controversy right now about non-locality, local experience, space-time, causality, all these things. 
and um, people are writing about out-of-body experiences. I don't think any of that is the real mystery. The real mystery is how do you get an in-body experience when you're not in it? <laughs> no. If I asked you where are you, you'd probably say I'm here, wherever you are. And if I asked you where am I, you'd probably say there, on the stage. That presumes something. That presumes that that which we call I, which is the most common word we use, right? I saw the news this morning and I didn't like it. I uh, was once a child. I liked Chinese food. I went to see this movie. I'm in love. I'm upset. I is the most common word we use. Everybody. In every language. But who or what is I the subject of experience? And where is this I? Most people would say, it's me. I have a soul. It's in my body. Well, nobody's found it. Okay. Which can lead to only two conclusions. One is that um, I doesn't exist. It's a hallucination. Okay, but that's very difficult right now for us to come to terms with. If there's one thing you know, one thing you can say with certainty is, I exist. There is existence. And by existence I don't mean anything mysterious. Things exist. This microphone exists. This body exists. At least we think it is. And I exist. I'm the subject of this experience. But where is this I? It can't be found in the body. All the talk throughout the ages of soul and spirit, nobody's seen anything like that. So one conclusion it doesn't exist is not satisfying. The other is that it has no form. And having no form, it is not observable. But without it, there's no observation. The formless gives rise to all form. That even physics acknowledges, right? The quantum vacuum, presumably, quantum field theory is, uh, is formless, even though it has a certain structure of probabilities. But if I is consciousness, and I is formless, then it is inconceivable. Inconceivable. How do you conceive that which is formless? And if it is formless, it's also infinite. And if it's infinite, it can't be in space-time. Even if the universe extends to 47 billion light years from where we are, and that's the limit, that's not infinite. Infinite means no boundaries. And actually, I once did a survey of physicists, quantum physicists, with all these different interpretations. I said, is there one thing that you can guys can agree on? Okay. And they did. They said, Fundamental reality has no boundaries, okay. which means it is formless, which means it is infinite, which means it's inconceivable. <laughs> but without it, there's no conception, there's no imagination, there's no perception, there's nothing that we can call an experience. So the hard problem of consciousness is hard because we presume that matter is the ontological primitive. I recently interviewed Wilczek, the physicist who got the Nobel Prize. By the way, all Nobel Prizes these days goes to physicists who discover particles. For basically good technology. Okay? I asked him, 
Is there a substance? Has anyone ever proved the existence of a substance, an inert substance called matter? And, you know, he answered very blindly. He said, uh, our understanding of matter is still evolving. <laughs> but, you know, is there such a thing? Is there something called matter? Or is matter a superstition? So let's assume for a moment that you're a baby and you haven't been told what this is, okay? You haven't been told this is a flower, and this is a hand, and this is a body, and this is a microphone. Let's try and guess this baby's experience. Visually, that's an experience of color. And color and form and boundaries go together and shape. Color, form, boundaries and shape go together. Am I clear on this? The only difference between this and this and that is the form, the color, the shape. Now ask yourself, does color, color, have an existence in the physical world? Let's take the color red. Does the color red have existence in the physical world? You say, no, every time I look at something, it shows up as that red. But where in the physical world, in space-time, does color exist? And the answer is, it's not a property of the physical world. It's an experience. As an experience, we would call it qualia. Right? Qualia, quality of experience, quality of awareness. And quality of awareness has no presence in the physical world. So therefore, form, color, shape do not exist in the physical world. They are qualities of awareness, and in fact they are modified forms of awareness. awareness if I tell you, think of the color red. Right now, you have an experience. Right? But there's no color in your brain. The brain is dark. <laughs> there's no sound in the brain. There's no fragrance in the brain. There's no scent in the brain. There's no sensation in the brain. In fact, you can put a knife through the brain and it doesn't feel anything. What I've said about color, shape, form is true of sound. <laughs> Where does sound exist in the physical world? It has no location in space-time. So every experience you have, every experience, perceptual experience, which is a narrow band of human activity, every experience you have, including the experience of your body, which is a collection of qualia, has no presence in the physical world. So why do we think we exist in space-time? Where did this idea come that we exist in a world of space-time, matter, energy, information, gravity, which are all human constructs for modes of knowing and experience in human consciousness, and the only experience in human consciousness is consciousness modifying itself into sensations, sense perceptions, images, feelings, and thoughts. The rest is a human story. Including the story that there's a physical universe, a physical body, and a mind. In fact, what we call everyday experience is a unified experience of mind, body, universe, you can't have one without the other. You can't experience a body without a mind. And you can't experience a universe without the body-mind. They're one unified experience. And they're actually consciousness modifying itself into subject-object of experience. The idea of locality, it is an idea, it's not a fact, is based on the idea 
that I am embodied. Another misnomer. I am embodied. Well, the body itself is a shifting quality experience. If I think, you know, of my body, I can look at all the photographs that have been taken of my body since the day I was born. Or these days, even the ultrasound. <laughs> you know, 